The Simon Filer Podcast, giving authors a platform. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. feel very privileged chatting with the original Aussie G.I. Jane today on my podcast. Robin Fellows is the first Australian woman to receive the coveted Green Beret Award in the Australian Army. And her story, Wings of Change, is a compelling listen uh, interspersed with recounts of her time in the Army, her personal life, and the sheer determination and dedication of a woman who aims high and achieves her goal. Welcome to the Simone Filer podcast, Robin. Thank you very much. Very so, happy to be here. Awesome. Did I? So naturally, I am totally in awe of all your achievements after hearing you read your book to me, in particular, the Green Beret Award, which is awarded to a soldier upon becoming qualified as a commando. Have I got that right? That's absolutely correct. Okay, cool. Now, when I hear the word commando, I think of an incredibly strong, resilient, uh, authoritative man, (laughs) generally. (laughs) But obviously, this is no longer the case as you've opened up that path among other very impressive paths for women. So how did it feel when you achieved that honour? Well, I was very happy. And, but I did it for a reason. I really believe that we need to have beret qualified women in the Australian Defence Force. So, yes, it was a culmination of a lot of hard work and training and months and months, uh, post the selection course, months and months of courses. But it was to me, I had proven to the Defence Force leadership that women could and were capable of training for and becoming a Green Beret. And in doing so, that I was hoping it would open up the doors for more capable and competent women to also become Beret qualified and add to the capability of our Defence Force. Was it to begin with when you went to earn the Green Beret, did you feel like I'm doing this for all women or did you go in there thinking I'm I'm going to do this? I learnt earlier on my first um, deployment overseas to Bougainville is where I learnt that we needed to engage with men and women within the societies that we operate in and I talk about that story in in my book where we would be getting told when we were carrying out our um, duties with the peace process we were getting told by the male leadership and chiefs that everything was great and dandy and fine and the peace process was going well. Yet the women were saying, well, we are being raped, our daughters are being raped, we um, we have no freedom of movement, we can't, um, we're not part of the peace process, which in itself was not correct because Bougainville was a, is a matrilineal society, so they should be involved. So that was really my background and my grounding. So when I was actually approached to do this course, I went, of course, because we need women out there in these in these um, communities working alongside the men and engaging with the whole community to get the best result for that community or society. Mm, gee, that sounds like, yeah, that would have driven you for sure. Oh, I, well, I was determined and I, and I recall being approached and I was going, oh my goodness, I can't believe he is asking me to to attempt this commando selection course because this is, if I can do this successfully, this will show and demonstrate to the military leadership that women can be commandos and operate in the special forces and add to that capability. So I was very cool and calm and said, of course. I would be interested in doing the selection course. (laughs) And so pleased you did opening up that now for other Australian women. So do you know if any other women have actually achieved that apart from there were two others with you? Yeah, so three of us started the course and all three of us passed. That's incredible. So, and, and you did it with men as well in the in the same course. It wasn't just the three of women that were doing it and you guys actually beat men. A- absolutely. <laughs> so it, it's a very difficult course. It is a sel- selection course. So, But the three women who for the first time had attempted that course, we all passed. It was unfortunate the other two women, because they were Army Reservists, did not get permission to continue to do the suite of courses to become a qualified commando right. and receive the Green Beret. But I was fortunate as a regular Army officer to continue. 
But the door was certainly shut behind me. The commander of special forces said, no, we're not training any more women. What? (laughs) So, yes, so that was... So once again, when I was doing those suite of courses, I was very motivated because I thought I might be the only person who ever gets this opportunity and I need to prove to the special forces group and to our military leaders out there that women can do this and I was very fortunate to learn from our instructors that I was performing in the top five percent of the courses Mm. I did so it was very disappointing to then know that the commander of special forces said no more women would do the selection course and none have today so since then um, another two women that I am aware of have become qualified green berets but we should have, you know, not three or we should have, you know. As many as, as who want to do it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I, th- I think we have a big gap in our capability because we don't have women um, out there with our special forces teams. Mm, yeah, I guess. And after listening to your book, it sort of filters down through many levels that there's not enough women doing particular work in different roles in the army. Um when you got called the Amazonian woman in the army, mainly due to your height and, of course, your athleticism, uh, naturally included, of course, are your gorgeous good looks. So what did this title mean to you? And who was the first person to say, that's the Amazonian woman? <laughs> I just got used to it. Um, I found it very amusing. And, um, yes, G.I. Jane, Amazon woman. Um, what do you mean? I've used all the cliches. <laughs> So it was, yeah, you, you know, you if that's how people consider you, then that is, I, I thought it was very nice. And um, yeah, I certainly didn't call myself Amazon woman, <laughs> but I knew that I was referred to as that Amazon, Amazonian woman. Oh, I think that's very cool. <laughs> that's strength in that name. So when you were growing up, did you always want to be in the army or how did you get into the army? Uh, not at all. Army wasn't on, on my radar at all. I, I was quite good at athletics, so I was going to become a PE teacher. So I had got into university, into um, the university in Toowoomba, and I took a gap year. And it was in that gap year that I was approached by a family friend um, who said, you can earn money and you can do athletics in the army. You don't even have to work. And they'll pay you. <laughs> or words to Sold. that effect. So absolutely, I go, where do I sign? Yeah. And um, it, I actually never did athletics again after I joined. Oh. But it was, I have no regrets whatsoever. <laughs> um, you did the uh, commando course. That I'm sure is athletics. <laughs> Maybe not the 100 meter sprint, <laughs> but I'm sure that was included in that thing. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, I definitely use my athletic skills um, in in, in a, a lot of the courses that that we did. It's it's quite physical, and, and obviously the the commando selection course and and other suite of courses is highly physical and mentally challenging. Definitely. So, with your athletics, what were your star sports? I ended up focusing on the heptathlon, which is seven events, and I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the strategy of it. It was a huge amount of training, um, and I found out that I was quite good at a variety of skills, so that I was drawn to the heptathlon. So that is what I competed in um, right at a national level, national. right up to when I completed, um, I yes, in my gap year. I, I finished, I didn't know at the time that I would never do athletics again, but I, I, I was ranked in Australia in the heptathlon. Oh, that's sensational. Um, yeah, my kids did athletics and I also did athletics, but when you were reading and talking about athletics, like I've said this on numerous of my um, podcasts that it's really hard when you're narrating your book to me. I'm sitting here going, oh, I want to ask more questions. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise it would go on forever and ever if I interrupted you every five minutes. But um, so at school, how did you get into athletics? You know, was it just that you were a good 800 metre runner or, or you just didn't like working on English and decided I'd rather be in the field? <laughs> I think I have, I have three other sisters and we all did athletics. And I think that was actually probably from my dad. So um, little athletics? So, yes, right. little athletics. Um, 
and back then, so we would go down to QE2, the stadium at QE2, right. so the Commonwealth Games. Yeah. Had just, we'd just had that, and that was um, 1984. Two. Oh, 1982. Yeah, 1982. With, um, and so it was just athletics was just a really big thing at the time, I guess, in, in the 70s and 80s. So yeah. that's, we were all drawn to it. Well, good on you because it does take a lot of um, determination, dedication and training. I know we, through my kids, not through me so much because I think I went to grade seven with athletics <laughs> just quietly, but they did longer. So so obviously all that hard training and dedication got you to the dedication that got you to the Green Beret. So you had the gap year. Were you in your gap year thinking, I'm going to go back and study PE at uni or how did it, you know, what happened? Why did you then join the army? Well, I was, yeah, I was absolutely focused on going to university yeah. and becoming a PE teacher. Uh, and it was right towards the end of the year, I'd finished that national competition. That was around about the September. September, and I remember a family friend had just the timing when he approached me was after that and when he said you know you can join the army and you get paid to be an athlete um, I just went where do I sign and I went down to Brisbane uh, to the recruiting and within um, within a couple of months so the 11th of the 11th 1986 I joined the army right. as, as a soldier and obviously, the eleventh of the eleventh is Armistice Day, so yeah, it's a very, it's um, very important. You never forget day. that day, yeah. But I, since I've, I've certainly never forgotten what day I joined the army, and that was, yeah, that was really the transition. I think that short period of time after I'd finished the nationals, and I was ready to do something. And my sister, actually, my older sister, joined six months previously, oh, okay. and she was 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 going very well. So it was, you know, we were drawn, I think, at that stage to earn a bit of money. I'd struggled all year um, financially to, you know, to do all that amount of training. So, yeah, so it, it was probably a little bit of money that drew me into it. But once again, I had no regrets. I did, I served for 22 years wow. um, at that point in the full-time army. And still now I'm into my 38th year of serving and I'm still a reservist. So I, I certainly say to all my nieces and nephews, do consider doing a gap year in the military or, or joining the military because it is a really good profession to do. Mm. And you made a lot of friends along the way. Absolutely, yes. Um, my some of my closest friends are my military friends mm. because you go through thick and thin, and you become very close. Yeah, I can imagine. You have achieved so much, obviously, even just by the small amount that we've chatted about on the podcast right now. Not only you know gaining that green beret, being the only one so far in Australia, but you toured in war torn countries, and you saw a lot. I guess you know, just saying then that your friends and yourself have seen. Th been through thick and thin I can't even imagine I've worked with one other man that was in the army and his book was about PTSD Dion and uh, like even my hairs are standing up just thinking about what you guys have gone through so thank you <laughs> and I'm sure I'm not alone when I'm saying thank you for your service that you've done for our country and what you've been through how has it affected you some of the stuff that you've seen I couch it in that I feel I have seen the best and the worst of humanity. And that has given me this amazing perspective of what happens out in the world in which we live and the adversity that some of these societies are facing. In particular, the women, the children, the disabled, the elderly, the vulnerable people. And that is why I've focused certainly this latter part of my career. I have become a gender advisor and I've been very focused on where I am able to assist these women in these uh, war-torn countries so that um, so to give them the help that they need to um to prosper their own country, mm. to get back on their feet. That was my next question. You've done so much for civilian women, particularly when you were in South Sudan, Afghanistan more recently, because your job being the senior lessons learned staff officer in the Resolute Support Mission, a NATO mission, which actually started because of 9-11 in Afghanistan. How did that role come about and then develop? 
So, yes, that, that was my primary role over there as, as a senior lessons learned staff officer. However, I did get approached by the senior gender advisor who was Australian and she asked me to assist her to conduct meetings with the Afghan national women in their national army to look at their recruiting and their retention. So that is, I was more than happy to assist her and and do that. So I got a real insight into the cultural imperatives that that country has and why it is so critical that um, countries like Afghanistan and Iraq have women in their security forces. And you, you're still developing that role and, and building on that particular role or job, I don't know what you'd call it, the gender advisor. Yes, so now I'm more focused in South West Pacific, so a lot closer to home now. Yeah, And uh, is, that, is that in regards to the women in the army as such, as in their armies, the different countries' armies, um, or towards civilian or how, yeah? So it's a little bit of both. Okay. But we're certainly, it's the military and security forces first and foremost, because we are required to to conduct humanitarian assistance and disaster relief operations. So it's ensuring that we um, conduct our planning with a gender perspective so that we meet the needs of those communities that are affected most by the cyclone or the fires. And I talk about our own country here. I talk about Australia, where we have received help from a lot of countries, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, to name a few who came to help us in our our need, and then how we go and help these countries when they get hit by disaster. Mm, Okay. So it's not just about going to war the army, is it? It's obviously you're aiding in many different facets from natural disasters and so forth. Absolutely. So there is a spectrum of operations. And on one end of the spectrum, we have humanitarian relief, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And at the other end, we have complex high end war fighting. Yeah. So fortunately, where we in our country at the moment, we are very focused on how we can better um, assist countries in our region to cope with the um, cyclones and we're coming into high risk weather season so we're doing a lot of planning in that area. Mm. Do you enjoy that aspect? I mean you you started off obviously earning the Green Beret and being very physical and now you've been you said 38 years in the army that's amazing but your roles obviously changed throughout those years and how do you feel about your role do you think do you like this aspect of what you're doing? Absolutely I feel like I apply my whole 37, 38 years of service as in the regular army and and in the reserve, Um, even my business experience running my own business. But I find that I'm able to provide that input into the current planning and challenges that we have to provide the best humanitarian assistance or certainly the most effective humanitarian assistance and disaster relief we can um, provide to our own country and to our our neighbours. That sounds like a very rewarding job. And even, you know, just after working with you, I can tell that you're very satisfied with the work that you've done in the Army, which is all very evident in Wings of Change through your fabulous narration, I might add. Um, it's also a very personal recount, your book of your family life, which was far from easy given the fact that you were in a family where domestic violence was very prominent. How did you come to decide that you should include this aspect of your life when you were writing your book? That's a very good question because I certainly was not going to include my childhood in the book mm. that I wrote. And Once I started writing, though, I realised the way I thought and how I approached things was affected by my childhood to an extent, and I felt that the book wouldn't be complete if the reader did not understand all of what had happened to me and that you can have face adversity and domestic violence as a child, but that does not have to define you and that you can choose who you become. So that is why it en- ended up becoming part of the book and I think a very important part. Yeah, I, I agree. It certainly de- yeah, demonstrates strength. It, your book demonstrates strength, the whole thing, but, yeah, it's certainly those aspects and 
yeah, they were hard to listen to some of them, but and bless, you're awesome. <laughs> I love you, Robin. <laughs> Has it been cathartic, you know, the experience writing Wings of Change? That absolutely is what it has been a thousand percent cathartic i felt after i had completed the book that um a just a release of um a just a release that had happened in my life that little piddly things no longer no no longer affected me anymore and so i would certainly recommend to any of your listeners that uh, whether you don't need to write a book, you just need to journal. And I know a lot of people go, oh, journal. <laughs> that again. <laughs> <laughs> but it has, it, it has really um, been such a positive force in my life. And certainly I, I must also say this, going through this process of then reading the book, mm. turning it into an audio book, And I found myself getting emotional once again reading the book in your studio. And it just goes to show how important it was for me to look at my whole life and scrutinize it, work out what the lessons that I had learned, the positive aspects, and then move forward. And I certainly have received a lot of emails and texts and even letters from people who have spoken about different parts of the book that has resonated with them. So yes, I'm, I'm very happy having gone through this whole process and, um, and thank you very much for your um, professional guidance along the way. Oh, my complete pleasure. Thank you for coming on board. So when did you actually decide, I'm going to write this book? How did it come about? Were you just journaling or? It was... My friends were saying, you should write a book. And a lot of people, a lot of colleagues, you know, you should write a book. And it's interesting, the point that I actually got serious about it was in August 2021 when the there was the evacuation from Afghanistan and um, those terrible scenes that we all saw. And that was when I realised that we had just forgotten lessons, that we had thrown these 50% of the population, these women, these girls um, had been thrown under the bus Mm. um, and as they are now under um, back under Taliban rule. So I guess I wanted those lessons to be learnt. And, yeah, and that's when I made the decision. And I realised I couldn't write and work so I made the decision that I would stop work and I did for 12 months wow. and, and, and and wrote the book. Yeah, fantastic. I'm so glad you did. I think there's a lot of lessons. Like you said, you've got emails from people. There's a lot of things to learn from in there. It's one amazing ride, emotional, some incredibly happy times as well. And obviously an account of your life. Honestly, this interview is only a very small window into what people can expect from listening to Wings of Change. It's really an inspiring and incredibly compelling listen. What about now? What's your plan now? (laughs) You've got a book. You've done all this in the Army for 38 years, you know, and are you going to have a break or what are you doing? It's interesting that you ask that question because I've just been thinking about it. I am heading into a total ankle replacement as a result of breaking my ankle at Duntroon about 35 years ago. So I've just, I'm just looking at three months in a boot, not in a non-weight bearing boot. <gasps> and what are you going to do? So <laughs> you are so active. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very much prepared that I God has a way of saying sit down and relax for a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's got me thinking. I have been thinking about it on and off since I wrote the book actually and delving a little bit deeper into why I am who I am, how I got to be here and what are my thoughts on leadership, what is important, what are my values and I would like to dissect that and and come up with some presentations because I'm always being asked 
to come and present, whether it's International Women's Day or to come and do a leadership presentation or, uh, and I always say, um, no, no, I can't do that. I'm Why? Just, Why? And, uh, well, I, I actually don't like public speaking. Oh, okay. So, but after the impact that this book has had on so many people, I feel that that next level is, is to to get to the core of leadership because we have leadership in so many roles, whether you're running a household or you're a teacher or mm. um, businesses, or schools, businesses, everywhere. Uh, the people need to understand leadership and the core of leadership and what mm. and how they can be the best at it. So that is what I'm going to in my three months while I'm on crutches is I'm going to do some research um, into that. So I'm able to do that when I, I come out. I will still do some reserve work if required. Um, so but- not relaxing at all then? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can. I don't think I can relax. <laughs> I, I expect you to take a week off at least after your operation, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't think I'll make much sense. I think I'll be on some heavy meds. Oh, it's so inspiring. And, yeah, I'm looking forward to the results of that. It sounds very intriguing and exciting. And to also seeing you out there doing some public speaking. There's a lot of things that people could learn because, you know, even though you're really scared of it, the authenticity that comes from someone that's been through stuff is immeasurable. So uh, I think this is an exciting time for you, Robin. So how can people um, touch base with you or get a hold of your book? Obviously, we've just completed the audio book. Um, I'll keep you posted when that's out. Um, and Robin's done a wonderful job. Your narration was excellent. So I hate the sound of my own voice. <laughs> I hate the sound of my. You sound beautiful. <laughs> it sounds it sounds really good. It sounds so from the heart, and there's a lot of information, like I said before, in there that's very emotional and yeah, inspiring. So, so yeah, where can people find the printed copy and more about you? So at any good bookstore, it's uh it's an ebook or an imprint version. So on um, Amazon or Booktopia. So any good bookstore, and of course the audio version when that is released. Yep, that'll be on Audible. Do you have a website? No, I don't. Okay, so do you are you on social media that you want people to follow you? Uh no, I just no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, one follow me. <laughs> Maybe you should think about doing that. Call it Wings of Change on Instagram, Robin. <laughs> I'm not even on Instagram. <laughs> Or something else to think about yes. after you're up, yeah? Yeah, well, 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 I have time. I'll have a look at Instagram or Insta, as they call it. That's right. Oh, you're already very <laughs> hip. <laughs> well, congratulations on your achievements. Um, I'm sure that I'm not alone. Like I said earlier, when I say thank you for serving for the people of Australia in all your deployments and the work that you've done for Australian, um, the Australian Army and for Australian women and indeed women, obviously, globally. You're amazing and it has been my absolute pleasure recording your audiobook, Robin Fellows, and chatting with you today on my podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. It's been a great journey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for joining the Simone Filer Podcast. What's your story? Contact Simone for a chat at brisbaneaudiobookproduction.com. Oh.